Welcome to PDMA Corporation, home of the MC Emax. I'd like to thank you for joining us as we continue along in our presentation series. Once again, we're welcome to have Mr. Noah Bethel, the Vice President of Product Development, to join us. Hello from sunny Tampa, Florida. And I am Todd Gunderson, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing, and we're glad you could join us for It Takes Two to Tango, how the MC Emax helped two motors make it to the next outage. And in this case, it was really until the the repair could be, uh, the new motor could be made. Not always a quick thing. Not always a quick thing. So here's the problem. Vibration spectrum showed three times, 13 times. Man, and we hear that a lot, right? Just general elevated vibration at multiples of running speed. Not always can they confirm exactly what it is, but they know something's wrong. Uh, what, like we mentioned earlier, lead time for a new motor was 14 to 19 weeks away. That's critical. That's critical. Even making it more critical, you need two motors running at all times or you must reduce capacity to 70%. And there's the tango. And there's the tango. And what does tango mean? What do they say? Well, our good friend from the utility always used to say, it's all about the megawatts. Yeah, and in this case, that's $65 per megawatt. Uh, this could be significant if you lose that amount of money. Oh my gosh, yeah, the, the uh, stockholders for, might be a little concerned about that. For 14 to 19 weeks running at 70% uh, capacity, that has some potential uh, loss of earnings there. So, what does that mean? Sounds like a job for the MC Emax. And in this case, this customer had just purchased our technology. So, he was fairly new with it and came across this on uh, well, really his first pass of testing his motors. So, here's the, the motor in question. We're not talking about a small motor here, are we, Noah? No, this is a big motor. 1,000 horsepower, uh, 149 full-load amps, 720 RPM, so not a fast-running motor. Relatively low speed, low easier speed. to analyze. Yeah, uh, 117 bars and 90 slots. Man, that's great to see. So often we don't see that. If you go back to support and ask them to, to, to share their experience, very often they don't know the number of bars. It makes it, it makes it just a little more difficult to analyze. We can still do it, but, man, it's nice to have. It allows you to go deeper into that spectrum, doesn't it, if you know those parameters. Oh, yeah, your, your confidence level goes way up. Yeah. And here's the motor. So, we're, like we said, it's 1,000 horsepower. So, this is a large motor. A big vertical. Not, again, uh, it, it often have a little bit of slop on the, on the, on the upper bearing. And, it, and, again, it kind of adds to the complexity of the analysis. Hence why it would take 14 to 19 weeks to uh, make another one of these and, and get it into your facility. Well, here's some data that they pulled, and right away, what jumps out at you? Man, look at that, the sideband, the pull pass sideband, which is you know a rotor bar defect indication. But one of the things we always tell people, if you've been following our tip of the week, there's more than one indication of rotor bar defects, and this is just one, and it can be misleading uh, if there's mechanical variations that are that are part of the design. So, uh, but still, uh, way up at the red line, it's it approached the alarming condition, and certainly deserves a lot of attention. Yep, attention meaning you want different tests on it. So let's see what else we have. And well, here's Good our follow. inrush startup yeah. data, right? But we're using this more as process analysis, not so much inrush startup. Correct. You notice it's not showing the big massive inrush of current. It's taken during steady state, and and for this type of motor, uh, it should be steady state. And we don't see anything like that. We see, as you say, up choppy waters. This is a a, a large proportionally varying load, uh, you know, it, but the question we have to ask ourselves, if the load is not, you know, by design, changing the torque rapidly, as you see here, then what is causing that change? Right, and in this case here, we've blown it up, but it's the 10 amp swing, so we're not talking a small amount of swing, of current swing here. And we also have our demodulation data. Not one, not two, but three indications. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay, you set through our webinars, our, our workshops, we like to see three indications of rotor defect. And this is a good one. And I tell you what, the pole pass frequency amplitude in a demodulated data is one of the preferred indicators for trending. In fact, we gen our general guideline, 0.3. So this is well above 0.3. But let's say we, this is all our online data. What about offline? What would we look for offline if we wanted to look at uh, another way of looking at a p potential problem with this motor? Sure, filling in like of the six we talked about up front, the rotor influence check, a, a great tool for offline indications for rotor defects and eccentricity. Uh, trending of the inductance value is another very popular tool. Yep, so all of those right now we're pointing towards rotor, so we're gonna pull this rotor 
and uh, like we've said, after the 14 to 19 weeks to get this back, and let's see what this rotor actually looks like. Well, oh. normally you don't have white lines on your rotor, do you? Unless something's happened. All right, a little bit of heat going on there. So what's what's explain this heat? Why is this heat damage on here? What creates that? Well, each of those white lines are on a bar in itself, and that bar travels the length of that rotor underneath the the, the individual laminations that you see that are burning up there. Um, now current through a broken bar doesn't like to flow very well, so it tries to find another way to get from one end of the rotor to the other, and it's going to travel along that iron. It's amazing how how even though those are supposed to be insulated from each other. Current will find a way and create a lot of the heat. And this rotor is very close to what? Mm, just a few millimeters away from the, uh, the stator, which we talked about in one of our uh, previous presentations. Previous case study, right? So Some magic mind story, I think. It could be the rotor comes out, but if it's if it's. Uh, have a lot of heat coming out of the rotor, you could be potentially having some trouble with that stator too because you're right next to it. Well, visual cracks, wow. Mm. U G L Y, this crack has no alibi. It's, it's ugly. Yes, it it's is. It's a great song. It's I, ugly. That is a big crack. Don't always do we get that type of visual confirmation when you see that? It's like, wow, this is like the you know, a, a best case scenario for a case study, worst case scenario for the motor owner. Uh, when that thing heats up, it's going to expand even further and open up even more, creating a larger gap and more heat that's going to have to travel down the laminations. So we knew that we had to baby this motor along for 14 to 19 weeks. What are the things that you can do to make sure that that asset doesn't fail and put us into that 70% limited capacity? Good question. It's asked it a lot. Uh, can we keep this motor running? Uh, we like to know whether it's open or closed bar design. This one's closed. The bars run underneath the laminations. But the big thing, the number one thing we try to suggest is don't restart this motor. You know, more than ha you have to. So minimize starts and stops. Minimize load variations. In this situation, it takes two to tangle. Lean on the other motor as the, as the varying load motor, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. And here's our new new rotor, right? So we don't have those lines in case you were wondering if they come pre uh, pre designed with lines on them. No, they, they come definitely don't. Only after uh, you exhibit problems do you have that. So this is going to go into the system, and of course we want to take some uh, follow up data once we put it back into operation, wow. and we can see. Yeah, that's awesome. That's such a large reduction in that pull pad size, man. Yep, and when we look at uh, our our inrush startup data again. We see smooth sailing, no real uh, choppy waters that we saw, no oh, 10 amp yeah. swings, very smooth along there. So we knew this wasn't load related that was causing the, the Correct, uh, correct. All the torque changes went away with the fixing of the rotor bars. And then lastly, look at our after repair demodulation data. We went from 1 to 0.04. Wow, that, that's over a 1,000% drop in pull pass uh, amplitude, which is what a great sign for a good rework and uh, confidence to start that motor. Yeah, and set this as your baseline, and now you can move forward on it and do your quarterly testing or annual testing, whatever you have set up for that. Well, we'd like to thank you uh, for taking the time to uh, listen to our case study. If you have any questions regarding this, uh, you can give us a call at 813-621-6463 or contact us at www.pdma.com. Take a look at our website. We have a, a tremendous amount of information there, case studies and, and papers. And you as well, if you'd like to submit a case study, you get a free PDMA jacket. Mm -mm -mm. You don't necessarily need it in the summer months, but in the fall you may come across a, a need for that. Once again, thank you. We've enjoyed your time, and you have a great day.